I am so honored tonight to bring our speaker to us, and he also has his wife with him, and his son brought them over from Stowe. They came all the way out west to Medina <laughs> to be it with us this evening, and he's going to tell us the story of his time with General Patton over there in the Ruhr Valley. And then, when it wasn't all over, in another place, he wound up in the Philippines. And he's going to share these times with us. And there are books over there about it, as well as the DVD, which some of you may remember. Joe Huber spoke to us. He was the child prisoner of war uh, in the, uh, on the Goodyear Plantation in the Philippines. So this will be a good thing to also listen to if you want to hear Joe's story again. So Mr. Woodring, I'm delighted that you came and that your family came with us, with you, and please share your story with us. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I'm reminded again. Would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> Just to get an idea of the time frames here, on December the f December 1941, when the Japanese uh, struck the uh, struck the Hawaii. Uh, I was a 16-year-old senior in Harrisville High School, Harrisville, West Virginia. In December of 42, I was in the mail room at Goodyear Aircraft. December of 43, I was in Fort Benning, Georgia basic training with the ASTP, the Army Specialized Training Program. Uh, in the December of 44, I was in, well, in, in 86 uh, then, I spent a lot of time in, in uh, Camp Livingston, Louisiana, but in December, I was in Camp Lou Obispo with the 86th Division, preparing to go to to go to the Pacific, specifically trained for the invasion of Japan. In December of 45, I was on Luzon Island in the Philippines, uh, near. Mount Pimatuna, Pinatuba, near Clark Field. Um, but the period there in 19, in 40, 45, is when I was in Europe, is what you know, where we are supposed to talk about tonight, because that's where all the action was. But anyway, uh, I want to cover two two idea two things. I mentioned the ASTP, the Army Training Program. Now this was started in 1942, in December 42, because the Universities had complained to Congress that they were not getting enough people to their universities. 
So, Congress passed a law developing the Army Specialized Training Program, which was to, after basic training, you were supposed to go to college for a while. Then, uh, but that didn't last too long, so I ended up in the in the 86th Division in Louisiana, and from and from there I went to Camp Louis Obispo, California, and I was re getting ready to go to the Pacific. And the Battle of the Bulge came along, and so they, if you've been uh, too long on this program you will know that uh, Europe had priority in World War II. They, they got first choice. So when the Battle of the Bulge came along, they pulled three divisions off the west coast uh, to go to Europe. And we were one of those. So, but in the meantime, I had three training stations. So I, w I was well trained, <laughs> but uh, and uh, but when I was back when when we started in ASTP uh, in uh, in early in early forty three as I said the the Congress had. Uh, the the generals and admirals are saying they weren't getting enough replacements, so they uh, curtailed the ASTP and sent everybody to the infantry. To <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to tell you about what happened in the early spring of, of 1943. I, I was in Fort Benning, Georgia, and my uh, we were in two-story barracks with uh, with double up and down bunk beds, and my uh, the guy in the bottom bunk and I was in the top bunk. He said to me, he says, "I don't like the way things are going." I'm going to get out of here. But I didn't press him as to what the problem was. And so not long after that, I ended up with 102 degree tonsillitis and ended up in the hospital. And when I came out a week later, he wasn't there. Nobody knew where he was. But his footlocker was there, so I knew that he hadn't been discharged or anything yet. And two weeks later, I went back to get my tonsils removed. And when I walked in to check in, there was my buddy checking out of the hospital. And I asked him, and what he had told me before, he was hyper allergic to coconut. I said, well, did you get some coconut? He says, no. My mother brought me a coconut cake. <laughs> so, so uh, and she stayed with him because he, he would have ended up in the hospital or he might have died because he was so hyper allergic to coconut that, <laughs> that uh, she stayed with him and stayed with him all the time for two weeks he was in the hospital. But he got his discharge. And so I didn't question him as to why he was so anxious to get this discharge. But uh, I went back to, the, back to camp to start training further. And in about a week, everything stopped. And off to the infantry, all of the... <laughs> All the ASDP, unless you were in some specialty like medical, 
you were in the infantry. So I ended up in the 86th Division, uh, which had been re-upped from, from World War I. The 86th had been was the Black, Black Hawk Division, which had been the, uh, the Illinois National Guard in World War I. So, but they were doing training for replacements in the infantry, mostly for Europe, because uh, they had, uh, the invasion had been on and they really needed people. So, but you know, Congress then passed a law saying you, that the military could not send 18-year-olds to combat unless they volunteered. So, my birthday was in August, but if you weren't 19 by the end of July, so I was stayed in the 86th Division, and the 86th was changed from a training division to a for a combat division, and we went to California to pr uh, train for uh, for our landings, for amphibious landings. We were there for four months. One interesting thing I did when I was there, I got picked for uh, demolition duty, or training. I spent a week in training for demolition and I figured that whoever picked me for that did not wish me a long life. Did anybody ever do any demolition work? Yeah, because <laughs> you're supposed to jump off the landing barge with 14 pound pack of, uh, uh, of high explosive. Now, this is not your TNT. This is the stuff that that you get enough in your shoe, you can blow, uh, bring down an airplane, you know. So you, you could really, you could really take down a lot of things. But if you were carrying that on your back to take out the 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 walls or the or the uh, tank traps or anything. I felt that you were really, <laughs> wasn't long for it. But anyway, fortunately, I never had to use that. So we did amphibious training for four months, ended up uh, going down to Camp Pendleton, North uh, Camp Pendleton, and with the Marines, and got on a ship, and we took San Clemente Island, which <laughs> was a which was a Navy firing range. So that was a, uh, we were off the ship in the middle of the in dark in the middle of the morning onto the landing barge and circled till it started to break day and all the time the Navy was was shooting over our heads to give us a, an idea of what we might have to do. So that ended that and we got on a train and went back to to uh, back to Fort, uh, San Luis Obispo. And we were ready to go to the Pacific. But then they had the Battle of the Bulge in December, in the middle of December. I believe it was December the 17th. Everything changed. And when they issued us wool underwear, wool socks, we had some idea we weren't going to the South Pacific. So, so we ended up uh, arriving in La Havre, France, in in March, March the second. So, and we 
and that was a rough trip over because we were in a convoy moving at seven and a half knots in the winter time in the North Atlantic. So everybody, practically everybody was seasick on the way over, so we were happy to get to Europe. But, <laughs> but anyway, we uh, landed in the second day of March in La Havre, France. Okay, while we were there, we were at Camp Old Gold. Now, when we were in California, we had replacement colonel for the 343rd Infantry Regiment. So, and he would, uh, he would come around and give us a pep talks. His name was Colonel Kingla. And he would give us pep talks about we were going to be Kingla's Raiders. So, but when we got, to, when we got to Old Gold in, in France, He wasn't so, we were, um, my company, Company E of the 343rd was right close to regimental headquarters. And he was acting strange, like the, uh, he would have the regimental band out to play for him. And I know one night I was out in, on guard duty uh, not too far from his tent, and he was up all night. After a few days, they called us for a five-mile march, and when we got back, they said that they'd taken away Colonel Kingley. Uh, the report was he'd been reassigned, but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we were there 11 days, and, uh, and they reassigned us the colonel that had been Colonel Boomquist, who had been the 343rd Regimental Commander when it was, when it was formed. He had been a captain in France in World War I, so he was an old-timer. But anyway, they brought him back. He'd been, he had been in uh, Scotland. So we had uh, an, an old timer really for a colonel. Uh, after we were there about 11 days, uh, we put on a train, you know, in the 40 and 8 boxcars. You know, they were, from, they were called 40 and 8 from World War I because they were, would hold 40, horse, uh, 40 men or 8 horses. So uh, things hadn't changed since World War I. There was a lot of straw in the, in the boxcar, and that was it. And they gave us five days of K rations and a couple of five gallon cans of water, and that was for the trip. And so after three days, we, uh, we got to uh, right outside of Cologne, Germany. The next day then, we went into Cologne and uh, relieved the, the division that was on the, on the Rhine River. While we were on the train going from France to, to Cologne, uh, the um, Americans had crossed the Rhine River uh, at Remagen, and also the British had crossed up near the, the channel. So that the Germans were cut off on the Ruhr Valley. And, but they were still, when we got there, the next day, as the uh, forward, uh, the advance party went into Cologne, one of the sergeants was killed with a, with a mortar shell, so we knew we were getting close. And uh, so we spent a, uh, 
about 11 days or 12 in Cologne, Germany, along the Rhine River, and the Germans are on the other side. Well, and, and, but I was a, was a runner, so I was with the company commander, with the company group uh, headquarters, but every day I had to make a couple of trips down to the to where my platoon was on the river. So that, when we first got there, it, it was sort of tricky to, to, because the streets ran to the river. And so you, you didn't dare be in the street. You had to duck in from building to building. But, uh, but, but after about 10, 12 days, things really quieted down. There wasn't much going on. And we were then reassigned. We were leaving, we were replaced by the, by the I believe it was the 101st Airborne. And we thought we had really seen some action, but they came back there for R&R. &R. That was what they came back for, for R&R. &R. So we trucked to, uh, down to Remagen and across the, the the Rhine on the pontoons and and went in a ways into into the east of east of the Rhine and spent the night and the next day uh, we started north towards the Ruhr Valley. When we started north, we were near. In the late evening, we were going along a ridge uh, near Hirschfeld, Germany. And all of a sudden, we heard automatic weapon fire. So we, everybody ducked for the, over the side of the road or in, into the ditch. And when the the uh, automatic rep weapon fire ceased. We, we got back up on the road and the order was, was to charge the hill, rapid fire up the hill. So we ran up the hill, everybody firing their rifle as much as they could. And when we got to the top, nobody in sight. As soon as we got up there, then the Germans cut loose with, uh, on us with 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun fire into the trees. And then after they did that, they, we were getting artillery fire. The 88s were a very versatile weapon. They could be used as artillery, they could be used as a cannon, or they could be used for anti-aircraft. So we were getting anti -air with 88 fire. Actually, when they were using it as a as artillery. So they were coming along. You know, the fire was coming along the fr the front of the of the. Uh, woods and I was out at the edge of the woods in, in, under some bushes and all of a sudden I, you can hear an artillery shell just like that before it hits but it's too late to do anything but uh, the thing landed about 12-15 feet away and didn't explode. I, <laughs> I knew that my angels were looking after me but then later I was told that really it was probably a, an East European that had been brought to the German war factory and they would sabotage those artillery shells every chance they got. So since I was a, a, a runner and messenger, I 
then moved down with the with the captain for the night and shortly it started to rain a cold rain and it rained all night so I didn't get much sleep that night I spent the night leaning against a tree sitting against a tree trying to keep my rifle dry under a poncho so the next morning we were up early and then shortly after daybreak we were started for the to take the village now as we approached the village of course the germans were in the village and they, and as soon as they opened fire we spread out and i went with the with the captain because my job was if the, if my platoon could not be reached by radio or it was something that, that did not that you didn't want to put on the radio it was my job to take the message from the captain to the back to my platoon but anyway i was on the sort of on a high rise over looking over the uh, the other the four platoons attacking the village and i thought it was as i looked down there i saw the first platoon the second platoon and the fourth platoon the lieutenant the second lieutenant was out front say come on come on come on follow me but the third platoon the second lieutenant was at the back saying go 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 I thought that was, <laughs> I don't know which way was the way it was supposed to be done, but anyway, I, that, that stuck in my mind. But, <laughs> but while I was, was looking around to see what was going on and they were attack, the, the four platoons was attacking the, the city, uh, I looked and I saw a, a German running along sort of behind the hill he was i could see him from above his knees up and actually i didn't know where he was going at the time but he was really headed in the direction of where the artillery was that had been firing on us the night before but anyway everybody was headed was looking towards the village so i raised up my rifle on the at a standing position, he must have been uh, 12 or 1,500 yards away and squeezed off around. And boy, he dived for cover. He, I didn't hit him, I know the way he went down. But anyway, he dived for cover and I never saw him anymore. And we didn't get any artillery on us, so maybe that, maybe that helped there. But anyway, we, uh, the company, uh, went house to house through the village and, and up to the southwest side of town and uh, the Germans had retreated and everything was quiet. So long later in the day, I was at where we were at the at the west southwest side of the town i was at the last house out there sitting behind the house facing down the road the way the germans had retreated and the fourth platoon was out uh ahead there uh, just to watch for things and i was sitting at the at the back of this house and enjoying the sunlight and cleaning my rifle. But uh, I, I just had finished cleaning my rifle and I heard a commotion. I looked up and there come three or four tanks and the, and the, uh, and the tanks are always protected with, uh, with 
foot troops, you know, because tanks are very vulnerable uh, with, if they don't have uh, infantry with them. So they were, but there were three or four tanks coming up the road and infantry with them, and I slapped my rifle together, ran inside, grabbed my pack, packed everything up, took out uh, the front of the house uh, looking for my platoon. And I met my lieutenant, you know, the platoon leader, and he says, come on, and we ran back into the house. And he was looking up uh, above, and we found the opening up, you know, to the attic. And he motioned that he wanted up there, so I think he got on a chair or something, and I boosted him on up into the attic. But he was carrying the company radio. Now, why he had the company radio, I don't know. He must have just said, here, let me take care of it, because the company radio is the one that contacts back to everything, uh, you know, artillery and everything else. But uh, got him up in the attic, and he kicked off a board and on the side and called in the artillery, and he, he knew what he was doing because he had been, he uh, called in the artillery and pretty soon we got such a barrage of artillery that the tanks and four tanks and the germ and the infantry retreated. So that, that took care of that little uh, affair. But when I was in there, the houses were all br built mostly of stone or brick. I couldn't see what was going on. I could hear one heck of a firefight going on outside, but there was a foot of stone in front of me, and he was up there. My my uh, second lieutenant was up in the attic, uh, you know, directing artillery. So that was that. Ended that right for the moment. So then that evening, the captain called for two platoons to, to uh, go out on a scouting mission down the road the way the Germans had come. And when we got about two miles or so down the road, the road curved, crossed the creek, and went ahead. But at the end of the bridge across the creek, there were, the Germans had cut a large tree across the uh, across, and we had we had a a tank destroyer unit with us. I'm sure you've seen though you know what a tank destroyer is. It's the big rubber tires instead of instead of treads. And anyway, that stopped everything, and the, so the two platoons took off to the right along the creek. And uh, the captain went across the bridge up the hill behind uh, and into a house that was on top of the ridge, a little ridge there. And uh, so uh, then I followed him up and went into the back of the house. And from you had a view out the front window. You could see the road, the high, you know, down the road. And uh, so we were there for a a little while, and the, but the Germans were um, started firing towards along the creek, the creek. You know, the the all the most of the uh, the creeks was aligned by trees, and our two platoons was lined up along the creek, and uh, they were it just sporadic rifle fires in and uh, but someone in the second platoon which was my platoon would fire back it was the only fire from that area captain said uh, he tried to call the second platoon but every time uh, they switch on the radio on that channel the uh, Germans would block it the channel was blocked. So he said to me to 
tell, go tell the second platoon to stop firing. So I went out the back of the house, uh, and sort of behind the little ridge there, down the hill. And instead of crossing the, the bridge, I went down into the creek and crossed the creek. Or just as I got across the creek, uh, all hell broke loose. The, the Germans cut loose with, the, uh, with, with everything they had uh, along the creek bank there. So I knew my message was no good <laughs> then. So I went uh, back across the creek, up the bank, uh, and back to the to the where the the uh, company headquarters was, and until and the time I got there, the captain was calling in the artillery, and so the time you laid down a barrage of artillery, that was. Uh, the Germans are gone. So when when we went into that house, the I noticed that the, that the, a woman and there's never any German men around except old men. And so the but the, the the housewife and the kids were in the barn, and we were in what you would call the living room, which had the picture window that you could see down the road. So anyway, the captain says, we're going to be here a while. And he looked at me, and I must have looked awful tired. He says, why don't you go lay down and take a nap? So I went into the bedroom, and it was a feather bed, you know. Everything was feather, but I climbed into that bed with my boots on, and afterwards I thought, boy, if that woman knew that I was in her feather bed with my boots on, she would have been in there with a pitchfork regardless. <laughs> anyway, after a couple hours, they, uh, someone woke me up, and uh, the captain told me to, Go back to the platoon and give them the time that we were going to pull out. Uh, so I believe it was 10, no, what is it, 10, 22, 22.40 or something like that, which would have been 10, 10.40. And so we, so... Uh, at that time, everybody was on the on the road, and we marched back to to town, about two and a half miles away. As we approached, we saw a fire, a big fire. A house was on fire, and I wondered what had happened. You know, did the Germans attack while we were out on our little? Foray, but he, when we got there, it seemed as though the, the company clerk and the first sergeant and the kitchen had, ever, had all moved into town. And our company clerk, he was a nut. But anyway, they, they found a German... Uh, anti-tank weapon and he was uh, the clerk was playing with this and he fired it inside of the house and he blew the wall out and set the house on fire <laughs> so, so, so uh, anyway the, you, you know so we burned the house down <laughs> anyway but uh, that the next morning we started out the first thing we we came up on was the it was actually anti aircraft you know the twenty millimeter anti aircraft and the and the and the um artillery and we so they surrendered 
uh, the guys all surrendered, but the lieutenant jumped in his, what's the equivalent of a jeep, and took off. And one of the guys in the first platoon, one of the squad leaders shot him. And, uh, and the sergeant rushed over. What he was interested in was the guy's gun. He, the first thing, ripped the his, all the, the harness and the, and the holster and everything, and that was that was the reason he shot him, I think, because <laughs> I I figured if he was running away, you know, I didn't want to <laughs> let him go, but uh, so, and he says, anybody want the binoculars? And I said, yeah, I'll take the binoculars. Nobody else wanted them anyway. I got those home. That was my souvenir for the, for the, for the, uh, for, mo for the war. That was my souvenir. Anyway, we were going ahead in towards the Ruhr Valley, and a day or so later, we came into this town. Uh, and the only thing, you know, things had been real quiet. But we came into this town, and there was a factory up on the right. And all of a sudden, the doors flew open, and the people come running out. I don't know what they were, uh, language they were using. It wasn't German, it wasn't French, it wasn't American. And waving, and they wanted to hug us, and we fight them off. These were... These had been in, uh, captured from the east, uh, from the eastern Middle East. Germans had brought them there, uh, this factory, to to build war material. So they were uh, they were so happy to see us, but we didn't want them to interfere. But they uh, later on the uh, the, the colonel. I, he had me put out his memoirs later on. After, I mean, his family put them out later on. And he had complained that the people poured out of that factory building. They uh, didn't know where they were going. They had their worldly possessions with them. And they cluttered up the roadway to the point that we couldn't get our... Uh, vehicles through. Uh, but anyway, that was the first experience with some of the things that Hitler had been doing. Anyway, we, we moved on, and for the next few days, we didn't, our company didn't really run into any, any serious opposition. Now, some of the other units did hit serious oppositions into the going into the Ruhr Valley. But what we were getting was old men and young boys. We had the old men that had been conscripted, and they, were, they didn't want to fight. And the young boys, you know, 14, 13, 14, 15 years, Hitler's youth, and they were the most dangerous ones because you didn't know what they were going to do. But uh, I know as I was searching one, he looked like a deer in the headlights. He didn't have a clue what you know, it was going on. You know, I sort of felt sorry for it. But uh, we were lucky on that in that we didn't hit any more serious opposition into the Ruhr Valley. But the other other units did. So we got down into the Ruhr Valley and the, the, they surrendered. I think there were 30 some thousand Germans surrendered uh, out of the Ruhr Valley uh, there. But we were there about 10 days or so. And uh, I know I was in a we we had we were standing there waiting while the 
they were deciding what to do because the, the Germans had surrendered. So we turned towards the the nearest house. What what you did? What when we um, when we were going in from France to Germany, we uh, received a everybody received a letter. Eisenhower, and he was had said. Treat all Germans as your enemy. There's no, don't, they might act like friends, the civilians, but treat them as your enemy. So that's the reason why we always, if we were going to be held up for the night or any time, and we needed a place to stay, we didn't want to sleep out in the, in the open, so we'd throw a German out of their house, the German, and take over their house for, for the night. That was that was common practice. And anyway, uh, so we turned to the house close by, and the the, the guy that lived there, he. Oh, would open the door, come on in. And so we, and it was a, a mill, you know, and we went in and he took off to, towards his mill. Pretty soon he turned on the water to the water wheel and the lights came on. He had a generator on his water wheel and so we saw electric lights first time since we'd got off the ship. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but that didn't last. We stayed there for a few days, put us on tr trucks, and spent the night on a on a convoy going south. As you know, you didn't travel too fast a night convoy, truck convoy, with no lights. And so the next morning, we arrived at a town. We'd been up. On the, all night, and we went into the first town, first house there, and threw the people out to take over the house for the day. The breakfast was still on the bed, I mean on the table, and uh, but that was where we spent the the, the day. Next morning, about two thirty in the morning, they got us loaded on trucks. And so we went a ways. I don't know. We really know how far, but uh, it was about four in the morning when we the truck, the convoy stopped. We got off and we started marching, and uh, we could hear in the distance the artillery. And so we, as we w walked towards where the action apparently was. We passed the, the 155 artillery, and then we passed the, the next artillery, and we got a little further, and the tanks were lined up. And it was a, it was a river, and the tanks were lined up, and we marched right through between the tanks, and over the ba down the bank, and there was these uh, guys down there on the river with wooden rowboats. Now, what are they doing down there with w wooden rowboats? Well, we marched down and got in the rowboats and rowed across the river, and uh, all the time covered with artillery, and. And the tanks uh, and the and the cannons overhead. So when we got up uh, across the river, and, and the, so the the artillery then moved out ahead of us, and we took off. Uh, and then the next day, no later that day, the. Uh, 
here came the tanks. They had, the uh, the engineers had had put in pontoon bridges and got the tanks across on the, the what did I back up what had happened the when we started south we had joined with Patton's third army and this was Patton's uh, the way that he operated, he combined an infantry division and and a and an armored division. He combined them, put them together, so that when we crossed the river, and then after they they built the pontoon bridges, the tanks caught up, and when they caught up with us and stopped, and we climbed on the tanks and took off. That was that was Patton's way of operation. That was his what he was famous for. And you and you would ride the tanks until they ran into ran into enemy fire and then you'd get off. And they you know and you had the tanks with you to take the town or whatever was going on. But anyway this went on for, I don't, I don't remember how long, but uh, we outran our supplies. And so we were uh, looking for a place to rest for a couple of days. And we went into the, what was called, later I found out it was Steinhorn, Steinhorning. Steinhoring, which was an open city. It was, nothing had been touched. It was a hospital city. And uh, we stopped. They told us we were not going to stay in the town, that town, because it was an open city. And But we stopped for a while in an intersection. I looked down the side street and there was a hospital. That was the hospital. It was, uh, it had the red crosses all over the side and the end and then on the roof. And I, standing there in that intersection, looking at that hospital. And it didn't seem right because you didn't see any didn't look like a really look like a hospital. Now, they were uh, the patients were either young women. Uh, they were all young women, but they were either had small babies or they were very pregnant. Now, this was this is another one of Hitler's programs to create the perfect nation. Now, later on I found out that what was happening, the, uh, they would pick young, what they considered perfect specimen of young women and they would take them as part of Hitler's program, and they the and they would just sign them with an SS troop, an SS trooper, and they would either spend a a cruise on the Rhine River or some other holiday. And when they became pregnant, uh, because the SS troopers were, they considered their perfect specimen for a man, and these were what they considered perfect, nearly as near perfect specimen for women that they could come up with. And as they, uh, 
near delivery, they sent them to one of these homes. These were the Liebensborn homes where they would be, they would deliver their, the baby, but they would be, the, the baby would be taken from them and given to one of the party leaders to be raised. This was his plan. The you know for the for creating the perfect the perfect specimen, perfect German. <laughs> but anyway, but we moved on, and uh, we eventually ended up in Czechoslovakia. And we were there for a few days, and, and and the war and the Germans surrendered, and uh, so we, then we started trucking back to, to Europe. I mean, back towards France. <clears throat> we trucked back to. Mannheim, and waited a couple of days. Uh, no, we waited for three or four days for our 48 train to take us back to Old Gold because we were the last division in Europe and we weren't supposed to be there. We were supposed to be in the Pacific. So we came out. Uh, we were the first ones to leave Europe. But when we were caught the train at Mannheim and uh, went through Paris, I didn't get to see Paris. All I saw was the, was the rail yards. But all the time I was in Europe, they always gave you a ration of cigarettes, a, cart, a, a carton of cigarettes every so often. And I had given up smoking. Uh, back in Fort Benning and so I just put my cigarettes in the barracks bag and when I got into the rail yards in Paris rail yards there was a guy there buying cigarettes you know he wanted them on the black market so I figured this was my last chance to get rid of my cigarettes and I had probably a half a Eric's back full of cigarettes. <laughs> and so I sold him my cigarettes and it, I had two months pay from from the cigarettes in large French bills. And the rumor was that if you tried to convert large bills to American bills, you they would question you how you got them, but I never had any problems. So. I had enough for for about thirty day furlough when we got back to the states. <laughs> but anyway, um, the trip back was as bad as the trip over. It, we uh, we were double loaded on a ship. Uh, double loaded means that they assigned two men to a bunk, and it's up to you two to decide who's going to sleep in the bunk. But anyway, the, the um, second night out, we uh, had turkey, turkey and dressing. So the next, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up with an awful Belly ache, and I took off for the for the what they call the Navy called a head, and it was full, <laughs> and the people were lined up, and we as we waited there, the people the guys kept coming, and some of them would were fainting and falling over, but you know. We'd been in the army a couple of years, so 
Nobody tried to buck the line. Nobody offered anybody their spot in the line either. So <laughs> and the next, next day, to sick call, it was the same thing. A mess of people. That was, everybody went there. But anyway. <laughs> but when we were, another story. I, I don't want to run too long here. Heck, we're about ready to go home. Anyway, um, I'll stop there. Let's, <laughs> I guess they wanted a question and answer period, and they close at 8.30, so I better shut up. <laughs> yes? How old were you when you went to uh, Europe? Pardon? How old were you when you went over to Europe the first time? Uh, well, like I said, my birthday was in August, and so... I didn't go out as a replacement at the end of July, so I turned 19, so I was 19 years old. Your whole presentation, only once you ever mentioned food. <laughs> oh, you had to have food. <laughs> I'm wondering how, how, and what, how and what were you eating? Okay. When, when the kitchen could catch up with us, we had, the, we had food, you know, we had a kitchen that traveled with us. But otherwise, we'd use K rations. K rations were, uh, they were in a package for a meal. They were sealed in wax, but the inside, they were either, the, the food was either in a can or vacuum packed. So that was, that was the food that we ate. And uh, plus four single sheets of toilet paper. <laughs> so we, but when, when the kitchen could catch up with us, which was every, you know, quite frequently because they were right there with us, right following us close. When the when the first sergeant and the and the company clerk would catch up, also the kitchen would catch up. What what did he do after what did he do after the war? Well, for one thing, I started to Akron U when I got uh, in 1946. But one year and I flunked out because when I was in the Philippines, I became the manager of the uh, of the en enlisted man's club for the for the company because we were detached, and that was not good. So I spent a few years trying to keep the bars in business, unfortunately. But I later on. Became a truck driver, and I spent the rest of my working career somewhere in the transportation business. I say transportation business because I finally wised up, went back to school, uh, and got a license to practice before the Interstate Commerce Commission. So I spent my working career. I retired from Amatec, which was the, the Lamb Electric Division or the Small Motors Division in Kent. And I joined my son. And we, we had started a company uh, as a transportation broker so I worked another 21 years after I retired. So it was all transportation. <laughs> OK. I thank you.
for you taking us along day by day through this adventure. A little bit of a thank you for the Medina Library. Okay. Well, thank you.